Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage, Stephen Balcom. Thank you all very much. Uh, that was a tough coffee break to bring you back. I could feel and hear extraordinary levels of conversation going on, uh, particularly around the research. Uh, so anyway, thank you very much for being back so promptly. Um, so I have a great pleasure of mine to hand things over to another dear friend of ours here at FOSI, uh, Catherine Tiedelbaum of Amazon Family Trust. Catherine has held top online safety position positions at companies since the 1990s, when I first met her, um, way back in uh, 1998, I think we just agreed, when she was at Yahoo. Throughout these many years, she has been a true partner and a pioneer, bringing her thoughtful approach to some of the most challenging online issues. And she is going to be leading this discussion, and I'll let her introduce her panel. So please welcome Catherine and these wonderful panelists. sugar from all those donuts like we are. <laughs> um, it's my pleasure to introduce a fantastic panel today to talk about AI in the classroom, technology and the future of learning. And how lucky are we to be here today, this year, talking about it? Because I think we will look back at these presentations, these conversations, and um, hopefully smile with wonder of how prescient we all were. But we may also look back and say, what were we thinking? Um, because it is the moment. Um, I'm very going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves and also, if you guys don't mind, to share one example of the ways that you engage already today with generative AI in your day daily lives. Um, Carly Anderson, why don't we start with you? Hi, everybody. I'm Carly Anderson. I am a former elementary school teacher, a literacy specialist, um, a parent of a nine-year-old married to a high school teacher, um, and I am currently a content creator online. In terms of generative AI, oof, I have to say one thing that I am doing as a parent and a content creator, um, I am using generative AI to generate book lists for my child and for her classroom. So something as simple as, my kid is really into graphic novels. I would love a list of 15 more graphic novels that she can take to the library it has been really fun for us and very fulfilling. Wonderful, and one I would not have thought of. <laughs> Dr. David Bickham. Hi folks, my name is David Bickham. I'm the director of research at the Digital Wellness Lab at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, at the Digital Wellness Lab, we uh, do research and outreach and education at the intersection of technology and health for adolescents and children. Um, everything we do is evidence-based, so that means that we conduct research and we translate our research and other people's research um, into actionable um, steps for key stakeholders like parents and um, really mainly for well, parents, clinicians, and the tech industry. And the goal with connecting with uh, industry is to demonstrate and illustrate ways that small design changes can um, shape an environment, a default environment, where um, that encourages healthy and civil engagement with for young people. Um, I'm gonna not follow your instructions and tell three very short stories. <laughs> One. Give uh, a professor a, a microphone. I'm also, I'm also a parent. I have a, a 10 and 11, almost 12 year old. As a researcher, um, generative AI will just create research references out of thin air if you're not careful. So if you ask for a citation, it will just pull authors and titles together. And in fact, we had someone email us and say, oh, um, you know, the AI told me about this great study that you did. Can you send it to me? And this study just simply didn't exist. It was one that we had not done. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was, um, so also as my 11-year-old has an assignment, a weekly assignment with vocabulary words where they have to um, write short stories using all the vocabulary words. And, um, I was like, let's plug it into AI, see what happens. And they, and he, we, they wrote a, wrote a great story, and then he ended up, I was like, let's 
analyze it instead of using it. He wrote a story about a kid using AI to write a story, which I thought was good. And then uh, I asked my daughter before I came on because we were thinking about this. Uh, I said, you know, okay, Mira, how do you think AI is going to impact your life um, over the course of your life? And she looked at me and she said, you know, I, I really don't know, but let's ask Alexa. She knows everything. <laughs> That's a good segue. <laughs> and my third panelist is Arjun Venkatswamy, and hopefully I did that right, um, from Alexa Kids Experience. Hi, everyone. I'm Arjun. And um, on the Alexa Kids team, we work to build safe and delightful experiences for kids um, on Alexa. And prior to working as a product manager on Alexa Kids, I taught software development to adults and kids. Um, specifically, I, I, I met a couple of Roblox folks today, and we had a lot of fun building Roblox mods. It's a super great educational experience. Um, and uh, prior to that, I actually started my career as a high school math teacher. Thank you oh, all. Oh, and Andrew. Gen AI story. So one from last week that has actually been really fun for me to play around with is I've been, uh, I've got a few friends with birthdays in the fall, and I've been using Stable Diffusion to make them personalize birthday cards. So basically turning them into like Pixar characters with their favorite like hobbies around them in the background. So it's, maybe it'll get old next year, but right now it's still pretty cool <laughs> fun. Thank you all. Um, so I wanted to kick it off with just some of the general de debate. The first thing you hear when someone mentions generative AI in the classroom, you either see enthusiasm or you see fear, just blatant fear. And especially among teachers who have had to continually adopt new technologies and feeling like perhaps there isn't a lot of support there in, in understanding how and where and why they should adopt these new technologies. How are they supposed to teach about it when it's all just happening right now? And so I thought we could just start with um, David, if you don't mind. Good, bad, <laughs> should teachers embr be embracing this technology or waiting for a little bit? Ooh. I mean, I think currently we're at a phase of disruption where it's really been introduced and that I think is where the fear is that it's, it's present but we haven't changed the way around the teaching or the assessment yet or building assignments to consider it. And so I think a lot of the fear comes from that. Um, I, I think, you know, it is our obligation and a critical responsibility of teachers and education to prepare, that, prepare our children for using this in the future. And I think that means moving beyond what I always talk about is like media literacy into recognizing that this is going to be something that transcends discipline or topic and that we need to in, include it in all the education that we do. And I think there's three ways to do that or three steps to that. We have to let kids understand what's happening. We have to show it to them. We have to, they have to learn how it operates, how it's using what's out there already to, to generate this, because it just looks like magic if you just do it. And we have to demystify it, which means we have to introduce the idea of bias. How is it biased and why? Um, then we have to let them play with it and do it and do like what you're talking about, create, really have fun with it, create images. And then we have to teach them that because this exists, they does not mean that they, they don't have to do the work anymore. Just because it, it, it gener can generate the answers to their homework not only means that they have to under, have that knowledge, but they now have to have a really deep sense of the reasoning behind that knowledge. And I think it's the teacher's role now to serve as how do we build that deep understanding and reasoning that we as humans will always, always trump these, um, these devices with. It's really interesting. When I started teaching, there was always a, an address of like, how do you teach critical thinking? And Carly, I'm wondering, do you have any thoughts on that? Like, how does critical thinking, it seems like David's touching on that. You know, this is going to be very a very elementary school teacher answer. It is a fifth grade common core standard for children to be able to look at a piece of literature or media and to critically decide if it's biased, what might have informed the author. We're really talking about that just in a different way, right? I think that we 
often underestimate children's ability to be a part of a conversation when we're looking at things like bias mm -hmm. and you're looking at a piece of media. My daughter is nine years old. She has looked at generative AI and she understands that it's not a human being that wrote the article that she's reading. So I think a big part of this is actually having that conversation with our children in a way that's developmentally appropriate for the age that we're working with. But we've got to involve them in the conversation. It's really interesting. And it comes to the research that was just shared earlier today, that the parents, uh, kids are looking towards parents, parents and children are looking towards educators, and it is a learning moment for everybody. Um, I'm wondering, Arjun, if you could kick us off in thinking about how this might change, change education in the classroom or in just the classroom management, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. And I keep thinking about how I would have loved to have some of these tools when I was a teacher because I think one of the common trends in education over the last 20 years is teachers just keep getting more and more things added to their plate. <laughs> um, and basically, this, like, you don't have any more hours in the day. You often have more students that you have to work with. So there's almost like a superhuman level of productivity you need to be an effective teacher as well as therapist and all the other kind of roles that you end up playing as a teacher in the school systems these days. So I, I think a couple of the things that um, have popped up to me specifically around making the classroom prep process a little bit more efficient are going through the things I would have done, spent a lot of time thinking about on my own, maybe not having, if I didn't have a colleague to bounce ideas off of, treating uh, some of these L uh, Gen AI tools, specifically the LLMs that um, have been definitely gaining popularity in the last six months as a content collaborator. So for example, if I'm coming up with a problem of the day for my class, and I know that there's a couple of kids that are, I mean, this is the case in every classroom, a couple of kids that are probably four years um, further than mm -hmm. the mean in my classroom, and then a couple of kids that are four to eight years like behind, like how do you make sure you teach all of them and engage all of them uh, together? So can I take a problem of the day give it to ChatGPT and say like, can you help me differentiate this for someone that's a few years above and a few years below? And that might save me 20 minutes of time trying to do that on my own and maybe not get me 100% of the way, but give me a skeleton that I can build off of. And similarly, like I would put probably way more time than I should have trying to integrate really dumb dad jokes into my <laughs> material that sort of resonated with the things my kids were into. And I think that's, again, like a place where you could say, ChatGPT, can you, integrate like 10 Pokemon into this worksheet, into the problems. And, and then they'd, they'd actually be legitimate and tied to real characteristics, where if I was trying to do it as a teacher, I'd probably make mistakes and um, <laughs> embarrass myself. So I, I think those are a couple of small ways. Either of you want to pop in on the ways to enhance learning or yeah, classroom I mean, I management? It, it's really, I mean, maybe it's just sort of building on what you're saying that I think we're set for personalization of education to be, you know, at a phase that it's never really been before because it can react very specifically to the child's needs. I mean, the current versions are able to look at a child's face and test their heart rate and really decide like how they're reacting to this. But even on the basic, like it knows where you need to learn. It knows it can trigger and activate a teacher to say, I've got this kid as far as I could in this. You need to step in, they're not progressing. Um, so, I mean, I think mm -hmm. that's the positive. I think the challenge is, you know, the teacher role has the potential to evolve from the person that's really directing the education to the person that's kind of managing the experience. And like that, you know, that's sort of, you know, there's, there's models about how this is going to work or what level we're going to get to, but that's certainly a possibility that that could be a future role for the teacher. I think something that I see, teachers need systems, right? When I was working as an administrator and I sat down with brand new teachers, my biggest thing was you need systems or you're just not, not going to survive the first few years. So I think systems for things like parent communication, and I think what I'm hearing consistently is we're talking about building a skeleton, not just generating an email and sending it off to parents, right? But the amount of time and support that this could provide for new educators to really put some of those systems in place, I think it can be very helpful when used appropriately and vetted and we put kind of the humanity into mm -hmm. it as well. 
Speaking of the humanity, so I, I get what you're saying about putting together systems and as an overwhelmed new teacher, absolutely. The more systems, the better. Um, the fewer things you have to decide in a day that is, consists of constant decisions, the better. Um, I think when I think about the efficiencies, like sure, it can provide personalized learning, it can make you more efficient, but is it going to step in the middle or somehow prevent what I think is the magic of being in a classroom, which is the personal relationships, the ability um, for human and emotional support? How, how is that going to be balanced, do you think, looking into the future? And this is Ted, all three of you, if anyone wants to take it. I think the key here is really knowing that this is a support, not a replacement, right? It's very easy whenever we have a new form of technology to go so far with it that we think it's going to solve every problem in education. I mean, we've seen it happen again and again. Just like a great piece of literature, a new study, a new form of curriculum, these things come out and what we have to do as human beings, as educators who love what we do is to say, I am the teacher in this classroom, right? I am responsible for these children. This is an amazing support for me. It's going to help me do what I love to do better, but it's not going to replace my judgment, my experience, my background, or my education. So keeping in mind that this is a support, it is not going to replace what I do. Yeah. I think on that point, um, I would say that there's no way that this tech isn't going to change critical thinking to some degree. And both looking ahead to how it might change it and trying to shape that process I think will be important. And the quote that always comes to mind, it's, it's pretty cliche, is that Socrates quote about how he thought that the invention of writing is going to rot everyone's brains. <laughs> and it, in some ways, like we probably don't have memories that are as good as before when people wrote things or didn't write things down on paper, but right. now that we're able to transmit information across generations and process things in an externalized way, we can just, just do so much more. So I think making sure that we, we take a both and approach where we have our students understand the limitations of this tech, but also how it can accelerate specific forms of create, like critical thinking and maybe get them to, for example, analyze and summarize five research papers in 15 minutes in a way that they wouldn't have been able to otherwise, but then deep dive into the ones that they think are really worth looking into. Really yeah, I interesting. Think, I, I, I think that there are, for the foreseeable future, be a critical role for teacher. I mean, we were just talking about, I don't think AI can manage 22 three-year-olds in the classroom, <laughs> right? Like that, their role is not just, a, I mean, it's about, about um, building a learning environment and then the tools are laid on top of that. And I think that that's one of the critical skills of teachers. But I, I do think there's some interesting kind of edge cases. Like we already can learn foreign languages and musical, you know, musical instruments without a teacher. Like there's programs now that do it pretty well for adults. And I, I think that that's interesting that there, I think there'll be more and more of that uh, available mm -hmm. in the outside of the school setting, you know, for like here's a way to access education. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the ways we know for little kids that they learn from characters and um, our tools of education already is through this parasocial relationship um, that they form with that. And that's something I'm very curious about, of how are young kids forming a relationship with these AIs? What would that look, what does that look like? And how might that impact the ability for the AI to teach in these kind of settings. That's a really interesting point about the parasocial relationship with an AI. What, can you give us a couple examples of what that looks like or what that doesn't look like? Because I'm not sure if everybody, yeah. including well, myself, I, understands yeah, like, that. Yeah, I don't know what it looks like <laughs> yet, right? But I mean, I think we have examples of parasocial relationships with children's um, media characters. That they, mm -hmm. it's, it's like a one-way relationship where you feel deeply connected with, with a, another person or a character that has no way to can have a, there's a one-way kind of relationship, right? But, but the, the, that relationship amplifies the impact of what that character is teaching, or it's been used in advertising and marketing too to like encourage purchasing. And, but, mm -hmm. but really with education, there's evidence that that relation, that the stronger the 
the, that relationship is, the, the better the education um, lessons can, are, are the more effective the education lessons are. So I think, like, I don't know. I mean, do we want to enhance that? Like, it's kind of a little bit yeah. off-putting to say we want our kids to have a relationship with this so that the education is more effective. But I think it's an interesting... On the other hand, it's not new. We've right. Been yeah, exactly. We've been doing char you know, character books mm -hmm. um, and character shows that are educational for decades now. Carly? Well, and I think when I think about any type of evolution in education, I think about what is our goal? What is our goal with education for our kids? It's to help our children enter the world as adults as healthy, functioning human beings who know how to interact with the world around them in a way that is productive and positive. This is a part of what our children are going to grow up utilizing, right? However we react to it, it is here to stay at this point. So I think we're looking at all these things, but they're not go it's not going to disappear, right? So a lot of this conversation is around what do we know about this as adults, as educators, as parents, and how can we learn alongside our children so we know how they should interact with things like this, right? Are we having conversations about, hey, you love this character and it's so cool that they're teaching you long division, but also, no. I think it's a matter of, it's here, so how are we going to discuss all of this? Yeah. If I could jump in really quick on yeah. the, both the critical thinking as well as this parasocial relationship comment. Um, I think one of the big dangers that we need to keep in mind with kids in particular is the fact that with Gen AI being so much more conversant, especially specifically large language models being so much more conversant in um, giving information, it's a lot easier to take it at face value and not be as critical mm -hmm. because, I mean, to the hallucination on research papers you mentioned earlier, <laughs> it, it sounds like it knows what it's talking about, so you assume it does, whereas like a Google search, it maybe is a lot clearer what seems credible and what doesn't. So I think almost like intellectually vaccinating kids mm -hmm. into understanding what they should be critical of and in what, at what phases I think is going to be really important as info seems to feel like it is true even when it may not always be. That's one of the things that I, I think about at this moment. It's very similar to the moment that I, Stephen already mentioned, I've been doing this a while. And uh, when I started, we were worried about kids, what they would stumble upon. Would they understand if this is a legitimate website or not? Um, would it be inappropriate? And we're a little bit at that moment again. So I'm wondering, um, you each have very different perspectives based on your background and the work you're doing in the past and now. Um, are there any rules of the road that we could say right now um, on how parents and guardians and teachers should start coaching their, their, their students, their children about learning and using AI? And maybe Arjun, I'll start with you. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, well, I think one interesting place to start is I think almost having kids change their mental models about what this tech can do and what it is, and a lot of AI already and even the information that kids are exposed to can be tied back to a particular source, but when you're interacting with a large language model, you can't always do that. So I think the very first thing that we should make sure kids have a mental model uh, change on is that these um, tools are in some ways almost more like uh, interacting with a human in some ways that is fallible and makes mistakes. And I think giving mm -hmm. kids like a foundation of expecting that mistakes will be made, I think will help kind of get them intellectually vaccinated into not taking everything at face value. Um, and in terms of other uh, like guardrails, I think the, the other panel had talked about gradually introducing this to kids over time and yeah. making sure that kids can almost like do the mental math before you give them the calculator. I think from a teaching perspective, making sure you integrate the tools throughout your curriculum, but integrate them in a gradual way um, and have kids be thoughtful about how they're using it as well as thoughtful about how you are using it as well is um, probably the, the other processing I think about as a teacher. Excellent. I think I automatically go to thinking about younger children, so ages 10 and under. Um, and what do we do in a classroom when we're teaching kids a new procedure? We model it for them and have discussion, right? So I think with my own daughter, who's nine, 
instead of just sending her off into the yonder and letting, <laughs> letting her use chat GPT, she has actually sat with us, her parents, and we've shown her how we're utilizing it in our careers now and had conversations about, this sounds a little weird. Let me research the fact that just came up and see, okay, are there other sources saying the same thing? Where did they get this? So I think, especially with younger kids, this is definitely going to be a slow release model with a lot of conversation mm. around, this is what I'm doing mentally to try to understand what I'm looking at on my screen. I think that's gonna be very important so that when those same children are 13, 14, 15, they now can independently, critically look at what they're seeing. David? Uh, for me, I think it's really about how much agency we give up with this tool. Like if we think about, mm. you know, someone had mentioned before like um, a, an analogy with uh, comparing it to a calculator and I was like, yeah, a calculator can give you the ma an, an answer to a math problem, but it's not gonna tell you what to do with that answer. And I think these tools really can do that. You know, you might, you might grade a kid's assignment with a calculator but you're not gonna figure out what educational track, the calculator's not gonna tell you which educational track they're gonna be on. But an AI could do that. I mean, we could use it to track our kids. And to me, that's when we start giving up important agency, human decision-making and agency. And so um, there's gonna be a point of trust in these devices where, or, where it moves from that kind of tool to something that's guiding the decision making and that's the moment where I think we're gonna need pretty critical guardrails. Thank you all and like I said, all different perspectives. I want to just take the last couple minutes and lighten it up a little bit, especially for those people who are hesitant about um, who maybe aren't the early adopters, probably like me. Um, what have you seen or what would you like to leave us with potential uses, benefits for creativity, for play, for using AI in learning? Any examples do you want to leave us with or point us towards? Arjun, yeah, I can, I can jump in. So something that um, I've done and I've, I've seen other kids do and have a lot of fun with is doing co-creation exercises with AI, both like uh, multimodal, like stable diffusion and DALI, as well as like text-based large language models, and have it not just be a consumption exercise where you ask for a story and then get it and it's kind of done, but maybe you ask for a story with particular characteristics and then you realize, oh, I don't like this part and this part, so can you change it and maybe like make this piece of the plot a little bit bigger and almost leveling up kids from like just creators into editors and art directors, I think, um, makes it feel more collaborative and also gives kids a sense of what's possible in a way that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Yeah, I wanna, I mean, I, my experience is parallel to that because I sat down, my son who really likes riddles and we're like, let's write some riddles <laughs> and let's tell ChatGPT what the solution is to the riddle and see what kind of riddle it comes up with. That's interesting. I like and that. then, so you can give it the solution and it comes up. And then you say, you know what? That second riddle is way too easy. <laughs> and it's like, you said, the answer is egg and you talk about shell, come on. And it will say, oh, I'm sorry. I recognize that now. How about this one? And that, like just witnessing that, that's what that's kind of magical component of. And I'm like, yeah, I don't really know how it's doing that. <laughs> like it's very amazing to watch. And I think it really spurs excitement and creativity around it. I love that. Carly, you get the last one. Oh boy. <laughs> okay, I want to finish with, I think it's a great tool to go online, to go offline. So we talked about this a little bit before. The idea of, I live in San Diego. Let's generate a list of 15 new beaches we want to go to this summer, you know, or holiday movies you want to watch, or art projects you want to do. I think this can be a great support to then completely exit the internet and do something totally different. There you go. Thank you all very much, and it would be fun to look back next year and the, year, the years <laughs> after to see how right we were on any of this. Thank you all. <laughs>